Uh, Cindy, you can go ahead and start recording. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us. My name is Dr. John Cangelosi. I'm uh, one of the co-founders uh, of Sages Diagnostics. Uh, for those that don't know who we are, we are a dermatopathology lab here based in uh, Houston, Texas. And I'll, uh, I'll give you a little bit of background of my story and how Sages became what it is um, in a quick minute. When, uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat box. I will um, address those. Uh, I'll have a midpoint section in which I address any questions anyone has, and then I'll have a, um, I'll address at the very end, any remaining questions. It's gonna be, I, my PowerPoints are, are more simplistic uh, because I want to I want to do more talking and less reading or and have you all listen more than and just read words on a PowerPoint slide. I do have some diagrams of trends, especially as it pertains to private equity. Uh, but a majority of this talk is going to be free ended. Uh, please feel free to to put in any question that you have. I, I wanted to save a significant amount of of the hour to address any questions that anyone has. Um, but I wanted to give you all some perspective of my background. A lot of the work that it took into starting a dermpath practice is very similar to starting a dermatology practice. And so there's a lot of, um, a, a lot of ways in which they overlap. And, and so by telling my story, I think you will get a good idea about what it takes to create your own story, if that's what you like to do. And then also, um, the nuances of a job interview and, and just getting to know a practice before you commit some of the things to look for, some of the things to ask for, and uh, what it looks like for partnership and promotions these days. Uh, so I'll get started. So my story, so I, I grew up in the Houston area and I went to med school here at UT, Houston McGovern Medical School, and went down to Galveston for a pathology residency and there really, really fell in love with Dermpath. I felt like that was, you know, a, a specialty that I, I really, I liked the clinical correlations. I liked the aspects of, of being able to uh, talk to the physicians, the dermatologists on a daily basis to, um, you know, share observations and come up with a, with a true diagnosis that could help, you know, help those physicians treat those patients and whatever ailments that they had. Uh, so it, it definitely was a, was especially in medicine that I thought fit me well. Um, with that being said, I originally was looking to join someone else's practice because that's what you do. You graduate, uh, you take your, uh, you do your fellowship training and you pass your boards and then you're ready to go. I just, in the Houston area, there wasn't a lot of great opportunities uh, to join a derm path practice. Actually, there was no dominant derm path lab at that time in the Houston area. And so it was either me move to somewhere else or start my own thing. And, and I decided that, uh, you know, I wanted to be in Houston it's where my friends and family were and starting my own thing was exciting, but I was definitely naive on the challenges that I would face. Uh, it was definitely a baptism by fire. I, there was a friend of mine who had a graphic design company and he had an area, a little area where he used to develop film. This was in 2011, actually, when I got started, July of 2011. And he no longer developed film because everything was digital these days. So I converted his, uh, that little area that looked like a lab in and of itself with linoleum floors, white walls. I turned it into a, a grossing area uh, for my biopsies. And then he allowed me to use a room next to, to that lab area where I was able to put a microscope and um, I shared his secretary and uh, away we went. I hired, I hired a friend of mine from high school to help me courier. And the first week, by the time we actually got that, I got everything started and I was February, 2012. So it took over seven months, uh, seven, eight months for us to uh, get, get things going. But when we, when we got started the first full week, I, got a total of seven biopsies. And most of that was from one provider in town who I knew closely uh, through, I, I knew his, I knew their family from residency training and I think he felt sorry for me, wanted to give me a shot. And, and so that's the, the way I went. Well, fast forward and we, you know, we've, we've grown quite significantly. I've taken on partners. Uh, we, we have 16, almost, soon to be 18 derm paths. And so we, you know, we've grown to, to really service 
the Southwest U.S. and and so I, I don't want to. That's not the point of my talk is is to describe that, but it it can work and it can be successful. But there's a lot of uh, challenges along the way. Uh, I think the first question you need to ask yourself is, do you want to work for for yourself or someone else? And you know that question is difficult because working for yourself is you're gonna it's gonna be a while before you're able to really pay yourself. A paycheck. I felt like it was appropriate for me to do that right after fellowship before I got accustomed to a larger salary. It's a lot easier to go from a fellow's a salary to, you know, not making much uh, starting your own practice than it is to go work for someone else, make a decent living, and then have to go backwards. Uh, but that's a question you should ask yourself right off the bat. And so hopefully my presentation here gets, sheds a little light on, on maybe helping you uh, answer that question for yourself. At the, the biggest challenges that I had when I started in 2012, was there was a large private equity wave of acquisitions. I think that that's a, still a challenge, but less so much now than it was, you know, four or five years ago. But as a graduating dermatologist that's about to go out into this world, uh, I think that it's important to understand the private equity landscape uh, because you will you will absolutely run across them in in terms of finding jobs or as competition. Uh, so this is the current uh, dermatology consolidation landscape now. You could see that private equity firms have uh, put more, more of their focus on practices that have five or more providers. Uh, so you can see here on the right, it's five to 10 providers, 16% of all consolidation was done in that area, 11 or more, 34%. Um, so over 50% of acquisitions were done by with practices that had five or more dermatologists in them. Uh, th the reason that that's important is because when you're thinking of joining a group, it's a question that you need to ask them uh, if you, you know, if they are, especially if they're a large group, you know, are they considering uh, private equity involvement at some point? And, and if so, you know, what the timeline for that is and what are the ramifications if they were to go down that road for, for any of the employees? They might not be able to answer all those questions, but I, I think at least having you addressing your concerns at the beginning is um, is important. Here you can see the dermatology uh, landscape throughout the U.S. Um, a majority of private equity um, concentration is on the uh, Northeast Coast, Texas, Florida, and uh, and California, Arizona. So a majority of the private equity firms have focused their attention in those states. So I think that if you were to look for an employment of any large groups in those states, you should be concerned about private equities involvement at, at some sort in time. But the good news is that private equity is slowing down their investments. Uh, this chart here, you could see in 2016, 17, and 18 uh, was really the, the hot years for private equity involvement in dermatology. Uh, they were not only a significant amount of existing PE firms um, that present at those times, but there was a significant amount of new private equity firms coming in. And that you can see that by this light blue um, top uh, part of the graph. You can see that that uh, part decreases tremendously in 2019 and the first quarter of 2020, um, in which there was only one or two private equity firms getting into the into this space when just three or four years prior, there was five, six, eight uh, private equity firms each year uh, joining or getting into the space. So I think that's a sign that uh, private equities, their, their bullishness on, um, on the, the dermatology sector is slowing. And you can also see this in that real, the actual amounts of dermatology practice being acquired by year has gone down quite significantly. So from 2018 to 2019, it dropped 45%. And then from 2019, the first quarter of 2020, obviously dropped significantly. Part of that is due to COVID. However, even when there was still a lot of cheap money around in terms of loans and interest rates and COVID, even when it was starting to be um, you know, less impactful, especially here in Texas and in Florida where those markets were opened up a lot earlier than other parts of the country, you still didn't see a corresponding increase in acquisitions in those states. So I think this is a clear indicator that private equity is, is definitely pulling money out of dermatology and into air, other either areas of medicine or other areas of businesses. But that being said, I think part of the reason why there, um, you know, the lack of excitement of getting into dermatology is less now than it was three, four years ago is because the costs of 
practicing in dermatology or the, the cost of practicing dermatology, the cost of practicing dermapath is, is increasing every year and reimbursement is going backwards. And so the margins just keep getting squeezed and it's harder for them to make a return on their investment is equal to maybe other areas of business in the country. So when you're thinking about doing something on your own, you have to think what it's like um, to, you know, you have to, I'm not going to go through this whole slide, but these are all the, this, this is just a small fraction of things you have to deal with on a daily basis. Um, uh, attorneys, um, employment benefits, payroll, billing, safety, people get sick, um, especially COVID, you have to work on PPP loans and, and uh, certain new rules on if uh, your employees get sick, what they're allowed to do, um, when they're allowed to come back to work, what kind of sick leave you have to, to provide them. So it is pretty daunting. Um, but with that, I, th I think is, is definitely a great sense of enjoyment and, uh, and pride that, that you can have if you start your own practice, especially if it flourishes in an underserved area. Um, so the first thing you have to ask yourself if that is what you want to do is do you have enough money to get started? So this was another um, area of, uh, of the business that I did not understand. I actually, I had a checking account at Capital One back in the day. I had it since college. I thought you just walk into Capital One and talk to a business lender and tell them you have a great business idea and they give you money and you get it started. Well, that's absolutely not the case. Uh, I walked into Capital One and they asked me for a business plan and financials for which I had neither. Um, and it was hard to have a financials for a company that didn't exist, hence why I needed the money. So I went to a one of the our local medical society had a young physician networking um, event and and I tried to make as many of those events as possible because you know just networking in general is important. Just if you start your own practice, you want you're going to want to network with other providers, especially family practice, internal medicine, uh, pediatrics, those that will need your services and will have patients that will need your services and, and if they know you're there, they will send patients your way. Uh, so it's important to network at that stuff. And But not only was I it found it important to network in terms of referrals for patients, but for us, for me, it was Dermpath. I also found it very important to get business um, insights. And so one of the providers there, he had just started his own endocrinology business, um, practice. And he gave me the information for a local community bank here in town that specialized in lending for physicians. And so my experience walking into that bank versus walking into Capital One was couldn't be far, uh, couldn't be more vastly different. Uh, the I walked into that community bank, went to a specific lender that I was asked to meet with. Uh, within 30 minutes, he didn't ask for a business plan. Um, he didn't ask for. He just asked how much I needed and and when. And so I he gave he gave me the money I asked for within 30 minutes of walking through that door. I had signed a couple of documents and being blown away by the experience and somewhat thinking that, you know, this is too good to be true. I asked him how, how he was able to lend so quickly when the other bank I went into, uh, you know, didn't seem like it would, it would take even, you know, they wouldn't even be able to do it in a month. And he made a comment that, you know, he's lending towards my degree, not anything other than that. And he knew as a physician that I would be able to pay him back regardless if this venture worked out or not, because I would always eventually have a high paying job that would allow me to pay back my loan. And so, I think that understanding of who I was, my background and my earning potential is important. And so you, it's all about finding the right lender that understands what your needs and who you are and to make sure that, uh, you know, in that partner, that lending partner is going to be there for you for the long haul. So, so getting that right from the beginning is very important. Uh, so, but you do, do need to have a business plan and that's important to, to put together because it starts, well, and it allows you to ask, to answer the question of how much do you need? I think one of the biggest problems starting a business is that people under appreciate how much funds they're going to need. Uh, so they underfund themselves. And so it's not a point that their business idea wasn't a good one. It was that they didn't give themselves enough runway to actually get off the ground. And so the, your business plan is there to help you answer those questions. Um, and so depending on what area, you know, not all business plans are going to be equal. If you're putting a business in a rural town, uh, your costs are going to be vastly different than if it's, you know, downtown uh, high rent district of a major city like Houston. Um, and, but your but your advertising will be different. And also your, um, you know, your workspace will be different. You might not need as large of a practice or a large uh, as many rooms. And uh, you might not, 
need as much cosmetics if it's in a rural town versus maybe um, a big city. So those are all things you need to take into account. But having that business plan will, add, will really allow you to, um, you know, understand what you're getting yourself into, uh, make sure you don't have any surprise for yourself and give you enough cash um, and a runway to, to get off the ground and make it successful. Managed care contracts. So that's another thing that I was very naive of. I thought as a physician, you just put in an application for your managed care contracts. Um, you can write to Blue Cross Blue Shield, Aetna, Humana, and asking for a contract, and they turn around and give you one. I thought that's just how it works. Well, that's absolutely not the case, especially in Dermpath. It's a lot, um, it, it's, it's vastly different depending on the region of the country you're in. There's definitely closed networks. Blue Cross Blue Shield up in New York and New Jersey don't give contracts to labs at all. Um, down here in Texas, they're a little bit more friendly, but they're getting worse. And, and it's just really difficult. And so you need to ask how easy it is to get into certain managed care um, networks, depending on what area of the country you're going to be in. And then with the advent or the, you know, Medicare replacement plans, HMOs, um, those are becoming more closed. They're doing uh, smaller or restricted deals with a small number of providers to keep their costs down. And so that the, the those networks are narrowing and it's becoming harder for, for physicians to contract with everyone. That's gonna affect your patient flow. It's gonna affect how you're marketing, who you're marketing to. And so that is important that you find out what landscape you're getting into before you start building your practice. Where that's important to do is find a, a local strong billing company. Uh, most people, uh, we end up internalizing our billing, but I couldn't afford that at the beginning. So we outsourced our billing at the beginning and that was important, though, to actually outsource that because a, a good billing company and you want to get a good billing company that's good in, in what you're doing. So for me, it would be Dermpath. For, for y'all, it would be dermatology. And that would be asking around to colleagues to see who they're using. But the really good billing companies out there should focus specifically on what you do. They should know your industry better than you do. And they should have the utmost knowledge of the managed care landscapes and, and should be able to give you a very good idea of what you're gonna be able to get into and what you're gonna be able to get paid for that. Marketing is also extremely important. Uh, I think with the advent of social media, Instagram, YouTube, it, it's never been more important than it is now to get your face out there, uh, to have an actual marketing plan, to actually create a marketing department or, or maybe department's a strong word, at least have one dedicated person to building out your brand because the difference that I'm seeing now in groups that are really growing a lot versus ones that aren't are the ones that put a lot of effort and money into social media marketing. That is the new way of getting patients through that door, especially if you want to cater to specific types of ailments, cosmetics, maybe acne in kids, uh, you, you, or, or pediatric uh, dermatology. You really want to focus on that online presence in order to target the, that patient population. Employees, another thing I was very, uh, I didn't know much about was how to go about hiring someone. I put an ad in Craigslist. Uh, looking back, that was pretty naive. Um, I got lucky with, with one of my first office, office managers that she was very good and helped me get off the ground, but that was a crapshoot. I think the best employees are by word of mouth. Um, other practices know who the good people are. There's constant movement of employees because they're moving to different areas of the town or different areas of the state. And so having a good network of your colleagues out there, I would highly recommend there's a Facebook dermatology group out there with a, a lot of participants. I am not one of those participants, but I do hear a lot about it. I know there's a lot of great information shared on that group. And so being a part of that, uh, when, when people have employees that move around, um, it's, you know, it, it's a great way to, uh, to, to get a jump on a really good person that you might not otherwise get to know if you just randomly put an ad out for an office manager per se. Also talk to your Dermpath. We, uh, we do a great job here in, um, in Houston, Texas, uh, and other markets that we're in, Arizona, Louisiana, Colorado. We get to know all the groups there, and we know when people tend to move around, especially physicians and PAs or um, uh, nurse practitioners um, and you know, medical assistants, MAs, it's we have we are a good source to just to, to see who's moving around and who the good people are and all you have to do is ask us and if not we can we can definitely ask around as well so um lean on on us to help you uh, find good people too 
So I'm going to take a moment real quick and see if there's any questions here. So I have one question by John Chan. Can an independent dermatologist choose with which path lab to send their specimens without influence? Or can a patient's insurance dictate which path lab the specimen must be sent to? So the independent dermatologist can send and refer specimens anywhere they want to. That is the practice of medicine. No, no, actually, actually even a, more importantly, not only can the insurance company not dictate where you send that specimen, neither can the practice manager, neither can your nurse, neither can the owner of that company, in, owner of the, um, of the group practice that you're in. No one can tell you what to do to practice medicine. You have complete autonomy. Um, actually, that's what you're held to. And if you were ever um, brought into a lawsuit, it would be any decision making that you made would be completely on you that you did that. You couldn't place the blame on anyone else dictating where you sent something that would be on you. So it is it is part of your right and uh, it's all part of your responsibilities to send biopsies to where you think your patient's going to get the best care. With that being said, there's a difference between what the right is and then the politics of dealing with the environment which you're in. So insurance is now are becoming a lot more emboldened to uh, write nasty letters to the practice saying that they're going to um, you know, remove them from the network or drop them from the network if they keep referring out to providers that aren't in network. Uh, I, I think that those can be fought and they have been fought. Um, it's not so much about in-network and out-of-network these days. It's you know in-network and then preferred in-network providers. Usually those are just the Quest and Lab whores because they have some sort of capitated rates um, or there's some collusion on the on the insurance companies and those big labs to scare providers into sending more specimens to them than, than the more independent laboratories like I would have. Uh, but the, you know, those can, so a lot of those are scare tactics um, and they just try to use intimidation to get you to refer. But at the end of the day, you have the right and the responsibility to send to the person that you feel like is going to give your patient the best, the best care. Uh, can you contract with Derm with the Derm Path for a rate for self paid direct pay model care? Yes, absolutely. We do that all the time. Uh, we so we um, and hold on, there's let me answer that, and then there's one more. Uh, we do offer aggressive cash rates, and so uh, please, I think that's the first thing you should ask a lab when you're signing on to them is what are their cash rates? Um, do they put you know can they give you a um, copy of those and then and then make sure that you let their patient know that if they do not get the cash rate that you felt like they were supposed to, that they need to reach out to that lab and, and explain to them that they were quoted a, a rate to be honored. Um, so you can absolutely do that with high rate, with in, ever increasing deductibles. The cash rate option is becoming more and more popular. And, uh, and so it's, it's definitely something that most labs are doing and you should definitely ask. Now there's a difference between the cash rate self-pay rate and what's the contracted rate. That's the one thing that we can't discount. So if your patient comes in and has a $10,000 deductible, they come and get a biopsy done. It gets sent to our lab and we work it up for lymphoma. You know, some of those workups can get up to a couple thousand dollars because of all the stains. We have to get T-cell gene rearrangements, uh, consultations at some point. So if that patient is in Blue Cross Blue Shield and they have a high net high deductible of 10,000, their bill from the lab is 2,000 and that bill is in network with Blue Cross, meaning that went to all their uh, deductible responsibilities, then the lab has to, has to pass that deductible responsibility on the patient. They cannot discount it right off the bat. However, if after they get one initial bill, that patient then cannot pay there's some sort of economic disadvantage there or whatnot. If they call the lab and a case by case basis, the lab can then negotiate with that patient for patient for payment um, in the form of a discount or um, you know revert to a self pay rate. But that but only after the initial um, the, the initial attempt to collect on the on the de deductible amount is made. Um, that's written in contracts, and if that is not done. Then the insurance companies can terminate uh, the um, the contract with the lab. Here's another question: How did you learn about insurance plans in a given area? Did you ask local PCPs? Did you blanket all insurers? Can insurers drop you? How can you find out which plans have high uh, deductible coinsurance to patients? 
Okay, that's a lot of questions. Let me start by the first one. How did you learn about insurance plans in a given area? That was uh, through my billing company. They they knew the area very well, and they were able to guide me through what they um, what they felt like was the most important uh, insurance plan to get on. Another thing I did was ask um, some of the I knew a couple of dermatologists in town and and asked them, you know, what were the most common plans they were seeing in their patient population. And so I cross referenced what my billing company was telling me with what I was seeing was, you know, real world data and to make sure that I wasn't, um, I was not, that I was covered enough where if a dermatologist sent to me that their patients wouldn't be getting out of network bills. Um, did you blanket all insurers? I, yes, all insurers that were in that area, in my area here that I thought was important uh, for me to get into. So, you know, there might be some Medicaid plans that, you know, if no dermatologist takes Medicaid in an area, then I don't need to sign up for Medicaid because I'm not going to be getting those plans. If there's certain um, pediatric insurances that, you know, just aren't getting taken by a lot of these providers, then I wouldn't necessarily get in those. Um, so it's important to not only talk with your billing company, but talk to the other providers out there and see what they're looking at and what they're taking. Can insurers drop you? Yes, they can all the time. They always try to renegotiate with you. And if you can't come to a negotiation or an agreement, then they, they only the only other option is to separate. Luckily here in Texas, that hasn't happened. Um, and, and where we've been able to work with all our insurance companies to stay in network, but I have heard of labs and I've had heard of providers drop networks because they couldn't come to terms on, a, on reimbursement. Um, what plans have high deductibles or co-insurances that I'm, uh, I'm not sure that you can really tell because I know that even in our self-employment plans for our employees here at Sages, we have, Blue Cross Blue Shield plans that were all Blue Cross Blue Shield, but we have different plans offered to different employees depending on how much they want to pay. And those plans come with different deductibles and different co-insurances. So even in one insurance plan, you can have different, different types of plans uh, that have different uh, amounts on those. And then Courtney's asking, what would you say is the biggest challenge you face so far in owning your own practice? Uh, I think those challenges change by year. I, I would think three, four years ago was definitely private equity wave. Um, when, you know, for, for me and being a derm path, uh, the referrals come from the, um, from the clinicians, the dermatologists out there. When private equity tends to uh, purchase a, a practice, they internalize most of the, this out of the referral services. So, you know, if they didn't have most before, they'll, they'll, they'll hire their own most surgeon and, and internalize that. If they didn't have uh, their own laboratory before, uh, they would, well, a lot of the private equity firms end up building their own lab once they buy up enough practices to make it, to make it uh, economic, economically favorable for them. And so that was a big um, challenge I faced was navigating, even though my, my customer service could be top notch and I had wonderful relationships with all my providers, certain things that were out of my control. And so if a private equity firm came in and bought up a bunch of practices in the Houston area, then you know, they could internalize that path and that'd be something I couldn't control in terms of losing out on, uh, on, on that revenue and, um, and, and that's the, the referral base. So that, that was a big challenge. When I first started uh, back in 2012, it was, uh, you know, interfacing with EMRs, uh, the high costs of doing that. Uh, there were certain EMRs like Emma that uh, were selective in who they were allowing to interface with. Um, which was against the law, but at the but at, at the beginning, no one had challenged that. Um, but eventually, with Emma, since they got so big, they did get challenged in court, and they opened up their interfacing, and so we were able to interface with them. And now we're, you know, we're a platinum interface client or partner where we are able to do all the fancy things. But that wasn't always the case at the beginning, and so that was a challenge to compete with larger labs out there um, that were able to offer um, certain tech technology and interfacing capabilities that we weren't. Uh, and so that, so that's, but that now is not a problem. So, you know, they, they change uh, from year to year and, and next year will be different problems. But I think the key is to stay flexible, stay open, uh, keep your um, costs down so you can take, uh, you know, bigger hits if they come, come your way. And uh, yeah, and just be flexible and, and know that, that there will always be challenges and, and that you, you know, you're going to be able to navigate them uh, with experience. Okay, so let's say you do now, instead of starting your own practice, you do want to get a job. Uh, so that's, uh, getting a job is, is, you know, 
obviously very important. You're about to graduate. You know, a lot of residents I'm I'm seeing now are starting to inquire about opportunities as as early as their end of your second year, um, which I think is, you know, there's a lot of things that can change within a year. And and I, I hate to see anxiety overtake a lot of residents where they feel like they got to get something or they're going to miss out on a great opportunity. I think it's important to take your time. I think it's important to see a ton of practices so you know what type of practice setting that, that you feel fits you, your personality the best. I think that uh, you know the best practices out there are word of mouth. They're not advertised. I think dermatology, there's enough supply. There's more demand for dermatologists out there than there are um, dermatologists to uh, to, to accept those positions. So coming out of residency, you're in a, a great position of, um, of need and of, of desire by practices out there that want to hire you. So I would not feel fearful or, or anxious that you have to get, you have to take whatever the first job that was, that was given to you. Um, I think the best is to call if you have a certain area of the country you want to be in or a certain state or a certain city, just cold call practices, find out who the practice managers are or the key, um, dermatologist uh, partners in those groups and email them directly, even if they're not um, advertising for a position and say, hey, I'm looking in this certain area, maybe put a storyline to that of maybe you grew up there, you have family there. Um, there's a reason why you want to be in that area. Maybe a spouse has a job there and, and you need to follow them. Um, pull at their heartstrings a little bit, but get, you know, you would be surprised on how many people don't think they want to hire someone until they meet that right person and, and they feel you know, like, wow, I wasn't looking to, I mean, I hear this all the time. I wasn't looking to hire a dermatologist, but she just seemed so perfect that I, I figured I had to have, you know, had to bring her on board and, and figure out how to, you know, get her full. So a lot of the, your, your derm paths can help with that quite a bit as well. Um, use us as a resource. Uh, we, we are, you know, we have hundred, over a hundred practices at, in the U S that refer to us. Um, if you were to call, you know, our lab or me and say, hey, I want to be in, in Boulder. Um, I We have a handful of clients that send to us there. I could send out a text or an email to the providers and say, look, I have this wonderful resident. They're looking to move from Houston to Boulder. They have some family there. I think it'd be great if you could at least talk to them. And, and a lot of times that's how things get started. And, uh, and some of the best jobs are, are done in that way. Um, for your resume and CV, I think all the key things have to be there, obviously your education, where you trained all that, but you know, that's standard stuff. I think another thing to really highlight on your resume and CV is your extracurricular activities, uh, what you do in the community, because you know, these practices are looking to grow. They're looking to get more patients in there. They're looking to increase their footprint into a geographical area. If on your resume, you've already shown that you're willing to get involved in extracurricular things, such as nonprofit organizations, um, at local organizations, uh, networking opportunities that allow you to work when you work for that practice to get their name out, uh, to um, advertise their services and to get more patients to the door is very valuable. And so highlighting that on your resume is extremely valuable and make sure to bring it up during any interview because as a business owner, you know, I'm always looking to bring on someone that can help me, uh, that can help me grow my business. The interview. So once you get the interview, I think it's obviously very key to interview with the top decision makers, usually that being the owner of the practice, uh, maybe the practice manager. But I think it's just equally important or even more important to interview uh, people a little bit lower on the chain. Uh, the MAs, front office uh, staff, other physicians that are working in that group. I think it's important to take the time to talk with them and get a feeling for what they you know, how they like working for the, the practice, some of the pros that they see, some of the cons. Um, I thought, you know, a really good interview. He always asked me not what all the good stuff that we have going on here is, is what all, you know, what bad things do we have? And when I say that, I mean, you know, what, what are things that we can improve on? Um, what, what are things that, you know, we feel employees wish they had more access to? Um, you know, asking those difficult questions, I think is important. And I think it's important for you to see how honest and forthright uh, everyone is in that group to share that information with you. And, uh, because everyone, you know, not not every not everything is perfect. But if if they if they look like they're having a great time, and yeah, there are things that could be done better, but they have an avenue of sharing those concerns, then you're in a great work environment. And I think you're going to be happy. No different than what you would ask if you were part of a residency. However, in a residency, especially in dermatology, most likely take what you can get because of the competitive nature. 
you do not have to have that mentality when it comes to getting a great uh, Durham practice. Um, there's plenty of great ones out there and uh, it, you should be really picky on where you select. Uh, once you get a contract, what are the things you can talk about or negotiate? I, everything's negotiable, but I would pick battles. Um, usually non-competes aren't very negotiable uh, because a non-compete is, you know, it's the practice's way of, of protecting their, their intellectual property, their marketing capabilities, and to protect the you know, employment of their employees. If you have a, uh, a large practice and, you know, you work with them, you get to know a bunch of their patients, the patients love you, and then you, and then you quit and start your own group right across the street. A lot of those patients are going to follow you. And now that practice is going to decrease in the, in the amount of patients they're seeing, and they're going to have to lay people off. And it's just very detrimental to that group. So I think non-competes, non-solicitations are very difficult to negotiate. And, uh, and I would be you know, if someone comes in and really we're trying to, to to negotiate that down, I would question what their intentions were. I think a more important thing to negotiate would be um, you can always ne negotiate vacation time or um, or you know salary, but I but I think a bigger thing would be negotiating uh, the terms of how often do you get evaluated for raises. I think that's important. A lot of that times that's not put in a contract. Uh, but but it should be stipulated. You know, every year uh, you should uh, get a chance to go in front of the partners and the managing partner, and uh, and get evaluated and discuss you know a raise or compensation increase. And having that in your contract, I think, is what it does. Is a contract? Yes, is words, but it's also an understanding between two parties of what your expectations are. And so if you put that, if you memorialize that expectation is that yearly you're going to be evaluated and in that evaluation, you're going to discuss increased compensation, then there's no surprises and, and there's no frustrations. Uh, you just know when it's going to happen and, and uh, there it is. And so putting that stuff, type of stuff like that in the contract, I would rather negotiate that than trying to, to, to knock off some miles on your non compete. Workplace camaraderie, I've already sort of discussed that, but you know, you really need to be happy there. You're going to spend more time at work than you probably would at home. Uh, so making sure that you you love where you go and uh, all the employees and, and just the, the type of energy and personalities that you see there mimic your own, I think it's going to make for, you know, just a great place to work and, and overall happiness. Uh, client patient relations. So this is going on to, you know, another thing to ask during that interview is what do they allow you to go out and, and uh, meet other practitioners on, you know, maybe go visit some primary care physicians or internal medicines around the area. Uh, show your face, you know, go talk to these doctors that will eventually refer their patients to you. Uh, will the practice support you in doing that? Will this practice support you in starting your own Instagram page? Will your, you know, practice um, support you in, in, in increasing your brand and creating your brand? I think that's important and something to bring up and uh, a great uh, practice will, will be very supportive in, in your endeavors of that, if that's what you want to do. And that's where promotions of partnership come in. So, you know, I think partnerships are coming less and less rare. Uh, I think um, what's happening is, you know, uh, it's just becoming where you, ju you just have owners and then you have employees. And, and part of that is driven by, you know, the, the new younger physicians that just want to work for someone. Um, and, and so, but I also think that it's, it's kind of a chicken and egg where most people want to just work for some because they've never been offered an opportunity for partnership or even thought it was an option. And so, because they never ask, they never ever give it. And so I think that the key point to understand why a group or, if it, or a managing partner would give out equity in their practice is not just because you're seeing a bunch of patients. It's not because you're doing all the things a normal dermatologist would do. I think those are just the expectations of a good employee. I think the key to a partnership and for promotion is that you're willing to do the things outside of what a normal dermatologist would do, increase brand awareness, uh, you know, focus on marketing and social media, going out to those um, providers out there and networking, would be willing to join the um, your local medical societies, committees, um, you know, the also what, whatever your community, like here, if it's the Houston Rodeo, being involved there where you can just get your name out, um, increase your brand within the community, and as people know who you are, they're going to know who you work for, and they're probably going to want to come see you or your associates at your practice, which is going to allow that practice to grow. 
So because you can, you're bringing new patients in that practice, you're valuable to that group and you're, you're acting like a partner. Um, and so I think having those sort of things is what you can do to show your worth and any great business person will want you to be a partner with them if they know that losing you is going to lose them business. And so proving your value and your worth in those endeavors, I think is a, it goes a long way in, um, in showing why you should be a partner. So right there, I'll, uh, I'll answer any other questions that y'all may have when it comes to uh, working in a practice or trends or anything else I, I might not have addressed. All right, well, I don't see any more questions in the chat. Um, I wanna thank you for your time and effort. Uh, we're here, uh, oh, well, here's, do you have any advice about choosing a new city? Uh, so yeah, I think one of the key things for choosing a new city, well, I mean, obviously the common things would be, you know, where do you wanna live? If you grew up in Southern California, um, you're probably not gonna to be too happy in, uh, in, in Houston, maybe because we're not near the coast like that, our weather's not the same. So you, you have to feel comfortable that whatever city you're gonna go in, you're gonna generally feel good about being there. But if you're looking at starting your own practice or, or working for a group that, um, that might be expanding, I think you need to look at areas of the country that are growing. So, you know, with the COVID epidemic or pandemic, you know, they, California is losing, um, uh, losing people, uh, New York is, of losing citizens, they're moving to areas with lower or no state income tax, such as Texas, Florida. Uh, so I think if you're looking to join, or to get into groups that are fast growing, you need to go to those areas where all the patients are moving to. And so Texas and Florida are great markets. Reimbursement in Texas and Florida tend to be higher than on the, coast, on the East and West Coast. And the standard of living is lower. So I think personally, there are great areas of the country to move to uh, because you get paid more and you're spending less. Um, and so those are, you know, but I think look, but it doesn't necessarily have to be there. If you wanted to move to California, New York, um, look for areas of the state that aren't covered by a dermatologist, call those, call a dermatologist in a certain area or a group of dermatologists in an area and ask what their wait lists are. If their wait lists are over three months. That's a pretty good place uh, that maybe there it's underserved and, and another, uh, and another dermatologist could do well there at a, rapidly by, um, you know, putting a stake in the ground. Uh, if you wanted to, um, let's see here and says uh, more precisely, which zip codes or locations for a new office? So yeah, I don't know if I have specific places to go, but I think the key is to look where people are moving to. And then if you can, if you can find a certain area that you feel like um, you'd be happy living in, call the local dermatologist in that area and ask them, you know, ask or pretend to be a patient and ask what their wait list is. When's the next time you can get an appointment? And if you, get, you start seeing that over three month um, quote go out there, then that is a prime area to be in because that means that there's a lot of patients that don't wanna wait three months. So if you were to open up your doors right then, you'd probably get a flood of patients right off the bat. Um, and so that's a key. So definitely, and it says here, so it sounds like in general, more rural areas are easier to open up a practice, correct? I would absolutely think that rural areas are way more easy to open up than metropolitan areas. Uh, because there's no derm, you know, most derms don't want to go in a rural area because they don't have to. Um, they, you know, there's plenty of opportunities to get a job within metroplexes of the country, and rural areas tend to be severely underserved. So those rural areas, usually those patients in a rural area, they either have to drive to a major metropolitan area to get seen by a dermatologist, or they go to their internist or family practice um, doctor locally there that tends to also um, moonlight as a dermatologist. So I think the, you know, if you're willing to go to a rural area, um, usually reimbursements are higher there and uh, it's going to be faster for you to get your practice off the ground. And you're also probably going to be taken into that community um, just a lot better than you would be in a major metropolitan area. That A rural area that's probably never seen a dermatologist go through there would be very appreciative if you decided to set roots there and would support you probably in ways that you couldn't even imagine. Um, what about access to a local derm path in a rural area? We don't have it. We actually have a significant amount of our derm path uh, gets referred to us from rural areas, especially of Texas and, uh, and Arizona and New Mexico. Oh, I'm sorry, not New Mexico, uh, Oklahoma. And so we don't, you know, with with uh, 
depending on how close that rural area is to a metroplex, we could have a local, we could have a courier drive out there every day. Uh, but with FedEx and UPS, it's easy just to package it up, um, FedEx it overnight, and we get it the next morning. And so it's the access to Durham Path in rural areas is, is not a problem at all. Um, it, it's no different than really servicing the metroplexes. So the next board review um, is going to be on June 26th uh, from uh, 12 to 3 p.m. That's going to be a Saturday. Um, if you'd like to register on our website at sagesdx.com forward slash education, uh, please do that. I, I hope all y'all are getting a lot of uh, a value out of our out of sessions like this, out of uh, the board review sessions, and, and just the happy hours in general. If you find that you like this kind of more of a business talk, uh, please let us know and we can try to, if you have some thoughts for additional uh, topics for us to discuss, may, maybe specifically, um, you know, contract negotiations or specifically uh, business, you know, or like what, what is the managed care landscape looking like? Or, you know, I can bring on friends and colleagues that have started their own practice and can really dive into those specific issues. Um, and I, that, that might be a value for you. So please feel free. We're always looking to make this more, more robust. We like to have, um, you know, really the, uh, the resident education and the buy-in from all the residents out there is really is what's helped us grow. And it's really a, a major part of our satisfaction of, of doing, of, of creating a Durham Path Lab and, and building it up is, is to be able to interact with y'all and, and to keep it fun. And so whatever you think that we can provide in terms of education to help you all out, please let us know. And, and we'd be more than happy to accommodate that. Um, I just saw a, a couple of other things come in real quick. So I want to do that before I I'll let y'all go. Um, let's see, how did you get into this large educational component of your company? Uh, that with a lot of downtime. So when we started, uh, you know, when you're, when you're only doing seven biopsies in a whole week, you got a lot of time to, to, <laughs> to do other things. And so putting effort into education, uh, teaching some of the local residency programs here was something I did to, to just pass the time and to help get my name out there. And, and while doing that though, I, I saw that there was an intense need. There was a lot of local term path education done in the, in the programs just by you know, local uh, dirt paths with, within the within the uh, medical school and, and within the department, but there wasn't a lot of virtual stuff out there. And so we decided to be kind of the, the virtual spot for resident education. And that really took off with COVID that I have to say that, you know, you know, couldn't have predicted that would ever happen, but it, it we, were, we put ourselves in a great spot to take advantage of an unfortunate situation. And so we were already uh, putting a lot of uh, effort and especially with Dr. Davis and teaching a lot of the virtual Durham path because we knew the boards were moving in that direction. Um, and so we wanted to get a jump start on that. And then we had the platform ready. And then when COVID happened, we were, we were already, you know, we had all, all things going just to, to put it, push out as much content as we had. And we were down 90% at one point during COVID with all the shutdowns, especially here in Texas. And so uh, we had a lot of, you know, Durham paths and me included that had a lot of free time on our hands. And we had a lot of, we have a, ton of uh, volume here and, and a huge slide library. So we just started scanning cases, putting together educational material and trying to keep ourselves busy um, while we were locked up. So it worked out well in terms of uh, pushing us uh, farther than we thought we would go with online education, but I think it's paid, um, it, it's, it's paid us back tremendously in satisfaction and, and just fun. And, and also uh, I feel like we're, you know, a lot of uh, y'all are getting a lot of value out of it, which is, um, it's just really cool to see that. Uh, so uh, to end this, if you ever have any questions, uh, please uh, email us directly, email your reps. Um, we have the ability, we have 38 state licenses here in the country. Uh, so no matter where y'all move, we, we can help you. But if it's not all about us, if we can help you find a practice and, and even maybe a local Durham path, um, that in, a, in an area that you're looking for, I, you know, we're pretty piped in with, with, with this niche of, of medicine. And so if we can't, if we don't know the answers right off the bat, we can definitely find someone that does. So um, it's not just all about us. We want y'all to be successful. All this comes full circle. Um, as long as everyone's doing great things, it'll, it'll all come around. So we're here for y'all. Anything we can do to help, please let us know. And uh, just wanted to thank y'all for, for 
tuning in and listening to me talk.